on this Palm Passion Sunday. Hi, I'm Russell, and I serve as pastor of two churches of the United Methodist Church Charge of Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Bennett, North Carolina, and also the Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church in Seagrove, North Carolina. Whether you're a part of the church family or just found us on the net today, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, for our church family, just let me announce about next week, which is Easter, that Easter has been canceled. Not really, actually, that's the only thing that this world cannot cancel out, is the resurrection. Uh, our service in the building has been canceled. We'll be online uh, next week, just as we are this week. We have lots of prayer concerns, lots of people out of work across the nation and also across the world, around the world. And um, with the growing death toll and all the uncertainty of the coronavirus, we are not gathering in our building. Uh, we have a lot to learn about where this is all headed and certainly we have enough to pray about today. And our worship today is all about how we are in God's hands. No matter what is happening, we are in the hands of the potter. We are the clay on the potter's wheel. Uh, appropriately, in just a moment or so, we're going to uh, begin worship with a hymn that is um, certainly appropriate for this picture. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. And so, uh, just a few heads up for today's worship. If you'd like to follow along in the Bible readings, we are going to be reading from Isaiah 50th chapter and also Philippians the second chapter. For all of the singing and uh, prayer times and scripture reading, the words will be on the screen for you. And don't forget to have the kids gather close by because there'll be a message for them as well. Uh, for your offerings and prayer requests, at the end of this video, there will be some information for how to send in your tithes and offerings and also prayer requests. So, if you need to prepare, hit the pause button. We'll wait. Go get a cup of coffee and uh, your Bible. And welcome. Hi guys, it's Pastor Russell again. I've got a question for you today. Do you know how to be content? Are you content right now? I don't mean right this very minute, but with all the things that are going on in your life. For instance, uh, you don't do schoolwork at the school anymore right now, do you? You do your schoolwork at home and uh, maybe you have some online things that you do with your teacher, whatever it might be. What are some of the good things about that? Well, maybe the good thing is you get to spend more time with your parents. Uh, maybe there's some really good things about uh, uh, the way you can arrange your schedule, about maybe not having to get up quite so early to make the bus or something like that. What are the bad things about being home? Well, you can't see all your friends at your house um, and you don't really get to, to do the playtime things that you get to do at, uh, at school at times in the, in the right uh, circumstances and everything. And so there's good about going to school, there's good about being at home. And uh, wouldn't it be a terrible thing if we spent all of our time worrying about um, the bad things that we have to go through now as opposed to the good things that we wish we could have. And then when we get those things, we miss the other things. You see, the reason the Bible says that God said to be content in all things is that he wants us to focus not on the bad things that are difficult for us. He wants us to focus on the good things that he has given to us. And he'll make us, he'll help us to make sense out of those things which are not so cool. So as we pray together today, let's remember the good stuff that God's got going on in your life. You ready to pray? Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that you give us good stuff in our life. We're thankful for our parents. We're thankful for the schools that care enough about us that even in this difficult time when we can't be together, Lord, you have given us teachers that still love us and still care about us and want to help us learn. We pray, Father, for this time to pass quickly and for people to get well. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, kids. See you next time. Hopefully at church.
Our Old Testament reading is found in Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 50, beginning at verse 4. The Sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom, so that I know how to comfort the weary. Morning by morning he wakens me and opens my understanding to his will. The Sovereign Lord has spoken to me and I have listened. I have not rebelled or turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a stone, determined to do his will. And I know that I will not be put to shame. He who gives me justice is near. Who will dare to bring charges against me now? Where are my accusers? Let them appear. See, the Sovereign Lord is on my side. Who will declare me guilty? All my enemies will be destroyed like old clothes that have been eaten by moths. And for our New Testament reading, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, he took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our message today is shaped by the hands of the potter in Jeremiah chapter 18. We begin at verse one. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter was working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped, so he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message, O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I had planned. And if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless it as I said I would. Therefore, Jeremiah, go and warn all Judah and Jerusalem, say to them, this is what the Lord says, I am planning disaster for you instead of good. So turn from your evil ways, each of you, and do what is right. But the people replied, Don't waste your breath. We will continue to live as we want to, stubbornly following our own evil desires. So this is what the Lord says. Has anyone ever heard of such a thing, even among the pagan nations? My virgin daughter Israel has done something terrible. Does the snow ever disappear from the mountaintops of Lebanon? Do the cold streams flowing from these distant mountains ever run dry? But my people are not so reliable, for they have deserted me. They burn incense to worthless idols. They've stumbled off the ancient highways and walk in muddy paths. Therefore, their land will become desolate, a monument to their stupidity. All who pass by will be astonished and will shake their heads in amazement. I will scatter my people before their enemies as the east wind scatters dust. And in all their trouble, I will turn my back on them and refuse to notice their distress. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We can miss the parenting genius of God when all we focus on is the deep water we're treading through and we keep asking, why God? <laughs> What did I do to deserve this? Why me? You may have felt that way during the current health crisis, the pandemic of coronavirus 19. Well, God sent Jeremiah down to the potter's house to watch the pottery lesson video. 
pictures, if you will, how God was going to deal with the nation of Israel. That's a great lesson of God's care and direction for us. And it's a good lesson for us today as we remember how God's hands shape our lives and how that care is the essence of the word love. And every bit of it is on the potter's wheel. And that's our illustration for today. I want you to consider the pottery lesson. I've got a number of pieces of pottery that I really love and I treasure uh, that we're well, one was given to me. This is my wife's that was uh, a goblet that she gave me for sharing the Lord's Supper. And uh, this is actually a piece of pottery that I made. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, consider the pottery lesson. Just so that we're on the same page about what this lesson teaches in the broad stroke, here's the essence of the text. Every, every time you come to a mention of the na nation of Israel, on God's pottery wheel, put your own name in there. Instead of Israel, let it be Russell or your name. In the phrase our potter friends use, you are about to be thrown. That's what a potter calls making a piece of pottery. They take the clump of lay, uh, clay and uh, they throw it on the wheel. And then they throw it, meaning that they shape it and they form it they make it into what they want to make. Being thrown is what happens in the process of living if you have decided to surrender to God's will. It's important to remember as we read Jeremiah that God never promises an easy life, nor does he promise a difficult one. He does promise an eternal life of purpose and genuine joy, not superficial happiness. I'd like for us to take a look at the tools that God uses in shaping us for the best life possible, both for our good and for his kingdom. The first tool is the wheel itself. In Jeremiah's prophet, prophecy, the wheel stands for God's natural created order. Think of this earth as the spinning stone. You and I are lumps of clay that been plopped down on God's wheel in our birthday suits, and we're totally dependent on everything and everyone. The fact is that we're usually, the, fa the fact that we're usually crying our eyes out when that happens is a pretty accurate forecast of the struggle that comes with living. And centering on that wheel is the most crucial, crucial issue, or the most critical issue for both the potter and the clay. Without being centered on the wheel, the clay will eventually wobble and eventually it will falter. It will never become what its possibilities promise. Just like the clay centered on the wheel, you and I have to center ourselves in God's will. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but Psalm 119 was placed in the center of the Bible, uh, right dead in the center of the Bible, uh, and that psalm is all about God's Word and how our lives will be blessed if we find ourselves there in God's Word. So we hide it in our heart and we find that our steps are well ordered. The wheel. And then there's the water. In this allegory of clay on the wheel, there are forces that affect the outcome. A potter will keep her hands and the clay wet with the water to help the movement and the smoothing process as the clay spins underneath her hand. Now it's hard to miss the symbolism of our baptism here. That baptism by God's Holy Spirit places us in God's earthly turning, spinning wheel, the church. That water changes our relationship from friction to friend. Water has a purpose for real pottery of reducing the friction and making it smooth. Our baptism does the same thing. At first, there is the friction of fear. We think of God, we fear a God who brought us into the world and like Bill Cosby said, can take us out anytime he chooses. Our baptism changes the relationship from fear into being friends with God, knowing that it is his hand that will not take us out. It's a guiding hand, rather, ready to mold us and shape us into the image of Christ. 
There is one factor that can change the whole landscape of this image. God is indeed sovereign. He alone is in control concerning his creation. But God's, in God's sovereign will, which is working in perfect harmony with his amazing grace uh, on that spinning wheel of this uh, earthly existence we have, there's one thing that he's left totally in our hands. God is sovereign, but he's given us this one thing. It's called free will, isn't it? Free will to choose whether or not to cooperate with the great potter. If you never received the water of cleansing, the water of baptism, it's not too late right at this very minute to bow your head and ask for his friendship. <laughs> Go ahead, pause. Hit the pause button. I'll wait. Now, if you've done that, because God was waiting for you, he was waiting for his clay to center himself on the wheel of God's will, right in the center of the wheel of God's will. Trust me, life will wobble a whole lot less if you did that, if you ask God to forgive you and to center you on his word and his will with his life. The wheel and the water. Thirdly, we have his hands. The potter's hands get wet and they get dirty. There are times when the clay just doesn't cooperate. <laughs> there are times when the clay doesn't cooperate and then the potter has to rework the lump and get the flaws out. We serve a God that doesn't make any mistakes. When there's an air bubble or an imperfection in the clay, it's not God, it's not the potter's fault. It's always the clay that has the issues. Let me tell you from personal experience, being reworked, to have God pick you up off the center, or off center, if you will, because you've been wobbling and you're turning out the wrong way, to have God pick you up and rework you, that hurts. The summer that I was 13 years old, the doctor said that my knees were both disintegrating with the bones. He called it osteochondrosis. I thought the man was talking in tongues. He told me that the only treatment was for me to sit down for the whole summer and let my legs heal by themselves because there was no cure. Well, I got angry at my potter, my doctor. He messed with my baseball plans for that summer. And it took some years for me to figure out that without the pain that brought me to the doctor, I would have gone on running and jumping on those damaged knees and possibly been in a wheelchair preaching you, to you today. Those hands may mess with your baseball or whatever other plans you have, but they are skilled hands. God knows the right amount of pressure to apply, to shape you, to bring you up from the inside out. That's what a potter does. He takes a lump of clay and he, sometimes he sticks his hands deep down in it and then he applies the right pressure the right way and as the wheel spins, it brings the clay up and forms it into the kind of vessel that is fit and usable. Then there are tools that the vessel uh, needs as well, that the potter needs to use on the vessel. At times, the potter will use a paring tool, kind of like a knife, and he uses it to pull away those bits of clay from the outside that spoil a vessel from being useful or being whole. Too often, we lumps of clay want to reclaim the pieces that are lying on the potter's floor. We want to pick up those things, those material things perhaps, or bad relationships, or control of things. And God says, wait a minute, I took that off. Don't you try to get that back. And then the hands will also sign his peace. A man in a previous church that I served uh, helped me make my very first piece of pottery, which is this piece I'm holding here. And at the end of forming it, he, he told me to turn it over and to put my mark on it, to sign it. So I did, I put my mark on it, I actually signed my name, Russell, June 6, 2011. I put my mark on it, and everybody who ever picks this up will see the underside of it, will know that Russell made this piece. In just the same way, God puts his potter's mark on us. And he does it with loving hands, skillful hands, wet and dirty hands, scarred hands, hands with nail prints. Finally, of all the tools, of all the potter's 
uh, machinery that he uses, the water, his hands, the kiln, is next. The fire. Ultimately, there has to be some fire applied to a raw clay pot to make it strong, to make it usable. When I made this, I thought I was going to take it home that same day, and as I was about to pick it up, my friend said, oh, wait a minute, uh, that's not done. I said, okay, I started to sit down. He said, no, you can leave, but it's not done. I'll put it in the kiln, and about several hours from now, it'll be ready. You can, you can get it Sunday at church. This is the purpose for our lives in Christ, to be usable, a usable vessel. And for that, generally, there is some fire that's necessary. I have a friend, her name is Reverend Julie O'Neill. She's a pastor who serves in the western part of our state. Uh, I met her while I was at Duke, and uh, Julie knows all about that fire, the kiln. Julie is married to Ross, who's also a minister. I want you to consider with me Julie's introduction to the fire the summer that I met her. Ross, her husband, was starting a clinical pastoral internship at Baptist Hospital in Winston. And so uh, that's in the middle of the state. They live in the western part of the state. And uh, Julie and I were attending school at Duke in Raleigh-Durham, slingshot all the way over to the other side of the state. So Ross and Julie had to live separately for the first time in 20 years for several months. That was a bit of fire. And another bit of fire was that, uh, sadly, Julie's cousin died the first week of school and she had to miss some time. And she also had to leave two days early because her child was getting married. And midway through the courses that year, she found out that she couldn't graduate with the class because she lacked two credit hours. Sometime a while back, before this school year even began, Julie gave herself a 45th birthday present. She decorated her wrist with a picture. Of course, for a pastor, a tattoo is a conversation starter no matter what. But when she's asked about it, she shows how the chain links that are on her arm uh, form a cross and how she is able to share that that cross is just above the deep vein that runs all the way from her heart up to her fingers. All of the blood that flows from her heart has to pass underneath that cross before it gets to the fingers to be usable. That's the whole point of giving yourself to the master potter. When you're in the center of his wheel, you're under the blood. When the water of baptism reminds you that you're his, it's because it's all under the blood. When his hands are smoothing out the rough places and forming the new places, you are under the blood. And when the heat is turned up and everything is cooked in your life, it will be okay because it's all under the blood. And in a few weeks or a few months, or however long it takes, when we gather back at church for the first time once again around the table of the Lord's Supper, when we're there and we remember that everything in our lives, good, bad, crisis, serenity, old, young, past, present, future, in season or out, everything is, say it with me, under the blood. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let it be so in each of our lives. For our sending, for our benediction, Learn to love your place on the potter's wheel under the blood. Thank you for worshiping with us this week. You have a blessed day.